Hey folks, this is Riker with a beginner's guide for Diablo 4. In this video, we'll go over some helpful advice for new players, things you may wish you would have known before you started playing, and some general advice towards being as effective as you can be moving into the end game of Diablo 4. In this video, we'll talk about which classes are strong and weak in the early and late game, plus what skills are best to use. We'll cover best practices on progressing through campaign into endgame content, some key information about items and spending resources, what's important to know about the Paragon system, and just a lot of general tips to smooth out your experience. And also after this video, you'll want to check out my guide on all the game mechanics. There are tons of different terms in Diablo 4. Vulnerable, Fortify, what do these mean? Why are they important? That's all covered in that mechanics video. And in case you want to skip ahead to different sections of this video, I'll include timestamps in the description below. But right before you do, just a quick reminder to ring that sub notification bell to be alerted to new videos. Now, the first tip we'll give actually comes from this video's sponsor, NVIDIA. If you're running a 40 series card, then you should make use of NVIDIA's latest tech to dramatically improve your performance. NVIDIA's DLSS3 is a breakthrough in AI-powered graphics that'll boost your frame rates while maintaining great image quality. When playing at 4K resolution, DLSS3 boosts frame rates by an average of two and a half. That's actually crazy. DLSS3 also incorporates NVIDIA Reflex, a technology that'll synchronize your graphics card with your CPU to ensure optimum responsiveness and low system latency. When we talk about latency, we're talking about how responsive a game feels, the time between you clicking and the game responding to your input. Higher latency means a longer response time. And with Diablo 4 focusing so much on needing to quickly react to and dodge different enemy mechanics and boss damage zones and getting punished with not just damage, but also long stun effects and freezes if you're not quick enough on the draw on that evade button, having low latency is more important in Diablo 4 than ever. To enable DLSS 3, you go into the options from the main menu or by pressing escape while playing, then you click graphics, scroll down to performance and toggle DLSS frame generation and your desired DLSS super resolution quality settings. If you're running 4K, we recommend performance mode, but anything lower and you can run quality mode. And this will automatically enable reflex as well. But if you wanted to enable reflex separately, then just toggle NVIDIA reflex low latency. While DLSS 3 will give you the best possible Diablo 4 experience, if you don't have a 40 series card but are still running an RTX card, then you can still use DLSS 2 to improve your performance. Oh, and also ray tracing will come to Diablo 4 in the future, meaning super realistic shadows and lighting. No date on that yet, but damn am I looking forward to it. All right, next let's talk about classes. First off, if you're a new player, I encourage you to pick a class whose gameplay you're going to find fun and enjoyable. Every class is viable to get through all the content in the game. Some have a harder or easier time in the early game, and in the super, super end game, some will be stronger than others. We'll go over that a bit in this video here, but I encourage you to check out my video giving an overview of every class to help better determine what class you want to pick and why. Because part of the reason people shouldn't just make their choices based on what's the strongest, what's the weakest, is that things are in flux. In less than a week since the game launched, Blizzard was already dropping balance changes, nerfing things that were overpowered, buffing things that were underpowered. But as of the current state of balance right now, we'll talk about what are some of the stronger skills for every class, and which Codex of Wisdom power you can grab early on while leveling to really improve your performance. And we'll explain what the Codex of Wisdom is later on. But basically, while you're leveling, you'll have the opportunity to effectively imprint a legendary power onto a piece of gear. But these things are kind of pricey, so you won't be able to do it all that much at lower level. So you want to really pick the one that's going to maximize your effectiveness. So if we're looking at the Sorcerer, the Sorcerer has a very strong early game start. But at the end game, it's not as strong as some of the other classes. Firewall is a really good skill for a sorcerer to build around both of the early and the late game. The best codex power that you can grab for it will be the prodigy's resource aspect in Witchwater and Hawazar. This will make it that whenever you use a cooldown power, you restore mana. And this isn't a huge difference, but if you have mana issues, this will really help. Then the other really good leveling skill would be Chain Lightning. This is the best leveling skill for lightning builds, if you want to be a lightning sorcerer. But it does fall off in the late game. And again, if you're having mana issues, then what you can get is the recharging resource aspect in Zenith in the Fractured Peaks. Each time Chain Lightning bounces off you, you're going to gain mana. Now there's also Arc Lash, a lightning skill that 
isn't going to be as good as Firewall or Chain Lightning for leveling, but for late game, it's going to be better than Chain Lightning. So you might want to start Chain Lightning and then respec into Arc Lash. The aspect you'd want for this one is Rapid Offensive. You'd find it in the Buried Halls dungeon in the Dry Steps, and this makes basic skills gain 15% attack speed. Arc Lash is a basic skill, but you can really build around it very effectively. And hey, no mana issues, because it's not a resource spender. And then if you really want to be an Ice Sorcerer, Ice Shards is going to be your best bet. It's not going to do as well as these other skills, Firewall and Chain Lightning early game, but late game it is strong. For Ice Shards, you'd want to get the Aspect of Piercing Cold from Dead Man's Dredge Dungeon and Fractured Peaks. This will make Ice Shards pierce three times, dealing 25% less damage per subsequent enemy hit. Moving on to the Rogue, this is a class that is very strong early game and late game. Your strongest leveling option is the skill Twisting Blades. This is a melee rogue skill. It's also one of the best late game rogue skills. The aspect you'll want to get is the Blade Dancer's aspect from Jalal's Vigil Dungeon in Skosglen, and this is just an awesome aspect. It'll make Twisting Blades orbit around you for a short time after they return to you, dealing 10% of Twisting Blades damage per hit, and then based on the distance they travel, they're going to deal even more damage. Now, Twisting Blades is the most skill intensive playstyle for the rogue. You really need to be appropriately shooting at your twisting blades and then moving around the battlefield to make those twisting blades travel to get the maximum benefit here. So if you want something that's easier but still strong, just not as strong, you can go with the flurry melee rogue. Not as skill dependent. And you can get the encircling blades aspect, which you get from the Forsaken Quarry Dungeon in the Fractured Peaks. This will make flurry damage enemies in a circle around you and deal increased damage. So better area, better damage. Now if you want to play a ranged rogue, ranged rogues are currently weaker than melee rogues. And either penetrating shot or barrage are both viable options early game, but then late game penetrating shot becomes better. For penetrating shot, you can get the aspect of the expectant. Attacking enemies with a basic skill increases the damage of your next core skill. Not a huge buff, but it is worth taking. You get that from Underroot Dungeon in Skosglen. Then for Barrage, you would take Aspect of Branching Volleys. This is in the Shadowed Plunge in Hawazar, and this makes Barrage's arrows have a chance to split into two arrows whenever they ricochet. We'll just quickly mention that another late game option for Rogue is the Trap Rogue. It's one of the best Rogue builds, but it requires first unlocking the Death Trap Ultimate. Onto the Necromancer. This class is strong early game and stronger late game. Bone Spear is a powerful early game skill and a super powerful end game skill. You'd want to get the splintering offensive aspect in Ghoulran slums in the dry steps. With this, Bone Spear's primary attack will make enemies vulnerable, and then the Bone Shards from the Bone Spear will deal more damage to vulnerable enemies and pierce through them. Another strong early game option is Sever. I really enjoy this, it's a lot of fun, but it does fall off late game. The aspect you'll want to get here only becomes useful once you unlock your key passive, but it would be the Blighted Offensive aspect from Akan's Grasp Dungeon in Hawazar, and that's going to make you deal increased damage after the Shadow Blight key passive damages enemies 10 times. Now for late game options, a very strong option for Necro along with Bone Spear is Bone Spirit. And I know a lot of people want to play a Summoner Necro. Currently, pure Summoner builds are viable, but they are weaker. You can get through the campaign, but if you're talking about like what build to run at level 80, 100, eh, it's not there right now. You can work summons into your build, but to be a pure summoner just relying on your summons, it's just not in a strong enough place right now for the super late game content. On to Barbarian. Now the Barbarian early game is a relatively weaker class, but it does become strong late game. Your best options for low level are going to be Rend. The aspect you'd get is Aspect of the Expectant. We spoke about this before. Attacking enemies with a basic skill increases the damage of your next core skill. You get it from Underroot Dungeon in Skosglen. Another good option is Hammer of the Ancients. And you definitely want to pair this with the Aspect of Ancestral Force, which you get from the Sunken Ruins Dungeon in Skosglen. This makes Hammer of the Ancients quake outwards dealing 32% of its damage to enemies in a much bigger area than the initial small area. It's a really significant buff to this skill. Now you can also go for a Whirlwind Barb, but of these three options, it is the weakest for leveling. But it becomes very strong late game. For Whirlwind, you'd want to get the Aspect of Dire Whirlwind from Garan Hold in Skosglen. This will make Whirlwind's crit strike chance increase by 3% for each second that it's channeled. Onto Druid. 
Druid has the weakest start of any class, but it becomes very strong endgame. Tornado is going to be your best leveling skill. Resource management, though, is an issue early on, so you can get the aspect of the Umbral from the Champion's Demise Dungeon in the Dry Steps. This will make you restore one resource whenever you crowd control an enemy. Now, if you want to be a Werebear, you can go with Pulverize. It's the second best option, and at endgame, it actually becomes the best option for the Druid. It's very strong. You'd want to get the aspect of Retaliation. You get it from the Seaside Descent in Dry Steps, and that'll make core skills deal more damage based on your Fortify. Druids can build up a lot of Fortify. What is Fortify? My mechanics video explains. In short, it's a key part of your defense. Then if you really want to be a werewolf, you can go with Shred, but it's weaker than the other two, both in the early game and in the late game. For this one, you go with the aspect of the Unsatiated in the Tormented Ruins dungeon in the Fractured Peaks. After killing an enemy, with Shred, then the next werewolf skill that you use will generate more spirit and deal increased damage. So, you've selected your class, you've selected what build you're going to go with. Now people ask, what's better to do? Normal difficulty or veteran? World tier 1 or 2? My advice for maximizing your fun and enjoyment of the game is world tier 2 veteran difficulty. To me, this feels like the difficulty the game was meant to be played on. At least at low level. Things are a little challenging. You have to feel the enemy mechanics. You have to learn the attacks. You can't just blindly go through everything. With some exception, of course. But dropping it down to World Tier 1 is substantially easier. And you really can just blitz through everything. Now the question may be, what is more efficient in order to get through the game as fast as possible and farm XP as fast as possible? The most efficient thing to do is World Tier 1 normal difficulty. You're just going to progress through the campaign faster, and even though World Tier 2 gives you an XP boost, the amount of time extra that you're spending to kill things just isn't a good trade-off. The only instance in which it's more efficient to play on World Tier 2, really, is if you are playing in a party and you're all really good and you're effectively killing stuff as fast as if you're on world tier one but here's the good news you can always change the difficulty you just go into town you go there into Kilvishad, you walk up to this statue you click on it and you change your world tier you can do this at any time either to increase or decrease the difficulty so you can play on world tier two if you find things are too challenging bump it down. If you're playing on World Tier 1, you think it's too easy, you're snoozing through the game, bump it up to World Tier 2. Or maybe you just got a really good legendary drop. You're feeling a lot more strong. You feel like you can take on that World Tier 2 efficiently. Go for it. Give it a try. Now, one thing that you want to be aware of while you're going through the campaign is that every zone has a minimum level at which monsters will spawn. You're always free to go in there, but while there is scaling in the game, enemies will scale to your level, they have a minimum level. Once you reach their level, they will scale up with you, but they will not scale down to you. So, something that happened to me, I was blitzing through the campaign as fast as possible, skipping all side content, and I ended up in like Act 4 or 5 as a level 20 in a level 45 zone or a level 40 zone. I forgot what it was exactly, but I was massively underleveled for the content, and now I was no longer being efficient. Now I was struggling my way through. So I would advise if you're going to play and you're trying to be efficient in your playthrough of the campaign, don't skip everything. You're going to reach a point where you're going to have to go then grind out levels. So one thing I feel is worth doing is as you're going through the game, whenever you see an orange event pop up and it's roughly along the way of wherever you're going, stop and do that event. These random world events, they're decent XP and they drop obols. This is your gambling currency, which you'll be able to use to gamble for targeted item upgrades. My general MO is to keep farming up those obols until I am full. Once I'm full, then I go gamble. I don't gamble right away because I try to effectively hold those obols as long as possible so that I'm leveling up in the meantime and I'm going to gamble for the highest level item I could gamble. That is to say, let's say I gamble at 100 obols and I'm level 20. If I had waited until getting 500, now I'm level 27, and now I'm going to be gambling a higher item that will be more powerful and will hopefully carry me for longer throughout the rest of the game. Now, the other advantage to doing these random world events, other players. It happens to me, relatively frequently, that I run into an event that is already started, 
halfway through or nearly done, thanks to other players. I mean, the best surprise is when you come to an event just as it ends and you just get a free chest with obols. Another thing worth doing is strongholds. There's only a few of these in the world, and once you've done them once, that's it, they are unlocked. But you get a lot from doing strongholds. You unlock sometimes waypoints, towns, dungeons, and they are worth a huge chunk of renown, which we'll talk about later. Also, strongholds will sometimes have within them a little campfire. When you see that campfire, go light the campfire. You're going to get an XP boost. There's a little mechanic here where you can get a short but significant XP buff. Definitely benefit from that. Another thing that you'll want to do as soon as you can, your class quest. Every class has a quest to unlock its specialization. As soon as you see that appear on the map, pretty much anytime you see any gray quest on the map, do that as a priority. Getting your class quest done as soon as possible is going to, one, unlock a power jump for you instantaneously, or some classes require you to effectively level up its specialization. I'm thinking of barbs, I'm thinking of druids. So the earlier you get that, then the faster you are leveling those things up to then benefit from their power. And another quick tip here, you can bring up that specialization menu directly by pressing Shift S instead of having to click through everything. Another tip here, you have six acts in the campaign. You unlock your mount at the end of Act 3. Once you get that mount, everything else becomes so much faster. So you might want to hurry your way to Act 3 in order to unlock that mount. Now to clarify, play the game how you want. If you're if you're enjoying going through the content, by all means, please do. But again, if you're asking how to be as efficient as possible, getting to that horse sooner rather than later will have a, a, a multiplying effect on your future effectiveness. Cutting out travel distances makes everything faster. Also, a tip about the horse. The closer your cursor is to your horse, the slower you move. So when you want to move as fast as possible, Bring your cursor all the way to the edge of the screen while you're on that horse. You really feel this when you're outside of towns. If you're planning to play multiple characters, once you've completed the campaign on one character, you can then choose to skip the campaign on all subsequent characters, including in future seasons. So if you're if you want to do two playthroughs, you might want to just finish the campaign on one character before you make your second. Unless you want to go through the story again on your second character. Because in order to unlock access to the end game activities, you have to complete the campaign first. We'll talk more about the end game activities very soon. Now another thing worth mentioning about the campaign is that the maximum level of enemies in the campaign is going to be level 50. So once you reach level 50, monsters stop scaling up with you in world tier 2 veteran difficulty so you'll be level 55 and the monsters will stay at level 50. i know some people are doing all side content as they go through the campaign which is great enjoy the game however you want but that means doing all the side content they're going to be way over level 50 by the time they reach the end of the campaign so just be aware that that is a thing i know some people were disappointed by that so just be aware of what happens when you are under leveled and over leveled if you're going either th too fast or too slowly through the content now if you do find yourself going too quickly through the content you've now hit a zone and you are massively under leveled for it one thing you can start working on is your renown renown is a system where in each of the game's five regions you get renown for effectively completing all the content or doing that in increments. We're talking about just discovering zones within the region. We're talking about finding altars of Lilith, completing dungeons, completing side quests, even just finding waypoints. All of this contributes or contributes to your renown. And renown gives you rewards in different tiers. You can reach tier 1, 2, 3, and some of those rewards are very substantial. Ultimately, you will want to complete your renown, but while leveling towards endgame, you can only complete the first three steps for every zone. That's before you unlock world tier 3. That said, renown is never wasted, so even if you've unlocked all three tiers of renown within a given region, 
Excess Renown is never lost. You can complete the region entirely, and then as soon as you unlock World Tier 3, World Tier 4, you can just instantly claim those Renown prizes. And Renown rewards have two tracks, the one that is character-based and the one that is account-based. So completing Renown will also help you on your alts by unlocking skill points for them, potion slots, eventually Paragon points. And again, at some point you're going to find yourself wanting to fill out your entire Renown. The most effective way to farm Renown is going to be on World Tier 1. You're just going to be more efficient that way. Also, if you're playing with others, you can split farm Renown, meaning you can split up, go into different regions, and everyone does their own dungeons on World Tier 1, which they should be able to do rather effectively. Whenever anyone in your party completes a dungeon, even though you weren't in that dungeon, if it unlocks an aspect for you, if you've not done that dungeon before, it's going to count towards your Renown as well. So, if you're in a party of four, you can be doing Renown completion for dungeons four times faster than by yourself. Another thing that's part of Renown, and just something that you'll want to do as a nice buff for your characters, are collect all the Altars of Lilith. Each one of these gives a little bonus of some kind to all of your characters. And you only ever need to find these once ever. It's going to count for all future characters in all future seasons. You could get them again on different characters, but when you click on that Altar of Lilith on a different character, it'll give you Renown, but it won't give you again the base buff effect, which is already in effect again on that character and on all your characters. So eventually getting all the Altars of Lilith is something you'll want to do. That said, it's not a huge priority because you're not getting an amazing amount of power from this. It's free power, so you do want to get it at some point, but you'll see that racing towards the end game and getting into higher world tiers and working on your Paragon is going to overall be a much more appreciable increase in power. So speaking about that end game, again, you need to complete the campaign to unlock access to the end game activities. We're talking world bosses, tree whispers, helltide, nightmare dungeons. And really your main goal once you've done the campaign is to unlock world tier 4 as fast as possible. Why? At world tier 4 is when you have access to the best drops. That's when ancestral items start to drop and these can be huge power spikes. So you finish the campaign, you're maybe level 40 to 50. Then you're going to go do the first capstone dungeon to unlock world tier 3. Once you're in world tier 3, now sacred items start to drop. And sacred items are better versions of regular items. Then at world tier 4, ancestral items start to drop, which are even better versions. These are the best possible items, ancestral items. Sacred and ancestral, they're just qualities of item that allow those items to have bigger numbers on them bigger affixes. So the first capstone dungeon to unlock world tier 3 is going to have enemies that are level 50. The capstone dungeon for world tier 4 is going to have enemies at level 70. Now, it's manageable when you're level 60. You got a good build together, you can get it done. And if you're skilled and have a really good build or really good items, you can probably even do it well before level 60. Now here's the thing about capstone dungeons. You can do them in a party. If all your friends need to do the capstone dungeon, you can have four people complete their capstone dungeon together. Or you can even be carried through a capstone dungeon before you'd be able to do it yourself. The issue with that is, if you couldn't do the capstone dungeon yourself, then you probably can't really survive in the next world tier. If, however, you can handle the capstone dungeon yourself, that means you can handle that next world tier, and you should be in that world tier uh, again. You want to start getting those ancestral bases as soon as possible, which you can then imprint upon. More on that shortly. Now, world bosses, again, those unlock after the campaign. If you see a world boss spawning, go do it. Once a week, you get a really big reward, but even outside of the really big reward, you're still getting rewards for doing world bosses. They don't take very long, and they seem to spawn about once every six hours, give or take. Outside of that, you're going to see the Tree of Whispers in the end game. That's what you're going to do at the beginning. Tree of Whispers is what's going to give you your first Nightmare Sigils to run Nightmare Dungeons. You also get other rewards from doing your Tree of Whispers. But once you've gotten some basic stuff out of the Tree of Whispers, you probably don't want to be going out of your way to get them done. As you're doing other activities that we'll cover, you're going to be sort of naturally completing 
these whispers. The Tree of Whispers gives you bounties throughout the world to complete, and once you've filled it in, you go cash in your reward. Definitely cash in that reward whenever it's full, but once you're well into the other content, it doesn't seem like you really need to go out of your way to do the Tree of Whispers. So what's some of that other content? Helltide. Helltide is very, 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 very important and useful to do. Helltide is gonna randomly make two adjacent zones in the world under the effects of a demonic invasion. This will happen every other hour and last for an hour. So it's one hour on, one hour off, one hour on, one hour off. Now you don't have to spend the entire hour within a Helltide event, but you do want to do the Helltide. Why? Crafting materials that you will not be able to get anywhere else that are very important to empowering your character via crafting. One example being Forgotten Souls. So in a Helltide, you're going to kill monsters, they're going to drop cinders. You cash in these cinders at chests that are found throughout the Helltide event. These different chests will be keyed to different item slot rewards. However, there's the mystery chest. Each Helltide zone, and there's two zones, has its own mystery chest that you require 175 cinders to open. My advice is farm up the 175 and get that mystery chest opened. You can start by scouting out the mystery chest and as you're looking for it, kill monsters along the way, get those cinders. But a mystery chest is going to drop roughly four, sometimes even five legendary items plus a bunch of forgotten souls. So you lose the ability to target farm a specific slot in exchange for overall a bigger reward. So I would say at the very least, get those two mystery chests if you can. Beware however, if you die, you lose half your cinders. Also, cinders do not carry over until the next Helltide event. So if you don't have a lot of time left, just turn in whatever you can. If you join a Helltide with only 10 minutes remaining, for instance, you won't be able to farm up the 175 farm up whatever you can and turn in whatever you can just to get some reward. If you're good and efficient, you should be able to get 175 cinders within about 10 minutes, but if you don't even know where the mystery chest is, then that's going to be a problem. Because the mystery chest does not appear on the map. It'll appear on your little mini-map in the top right corner when you're near it, however. Another thing you'll want to grab in Helltide is Fiend Roses. These are plants that you click on that only grow in Helltide, so definitely collect those whenever you can. You'll also notice that some destructible items in Helltide have a red glow to them. Destroy these, because the red glow means that there are cinders within them. Now another endgame activity is Nightmare Dungeons. This will become a very significant endgame activity, because it's how you're going to level up your glyphs, which we'll talk more about in a bit. They fit into your Paragon board. They are a very important part of your late game power, and you can only upgrade them via Nightmare Dungeons. You find them in Nightmare Dungeons, but you can find them elsewhere as well, but you can only upgrade them in Nightmare Dungeons. Nightmare Dungeons have a certain number of revives that you are permitted. And in general, the higher difficulty the Nightmare Dungeon, the fewer revives, with as few as four revives permitted. Here's the trick. If you are in a party, as long as you do not hit resurrect yourself, you are not consuming a revive. So if I die in party play and my buddy comes and revives me, that does not consume one of our revive attempts. So in party play, save those revives so that you don't fail the dungeon. All right, let's talk about items. There are five grades of items, normal, magic, rare, legendary and unique, and anything other than legendary and unique can be traded. You also can not trade legendary aspects, which we'll talk about in a bit. And yes, this includes with people in your party. You cannot even trade those with people in your party. Now, one thing to be aware of is if you're out farming, you don't have to stress too much about missing any legendary or unique drops or even herb caches. If you happen to leave any behind, they will actually get mailed to you, mailed to your stash. You can even use this to your advantage if, let's say, you're split farming and you see an item has dropped all the way two screens away, you can leave it and just wait for it to get mailed to you. Do be aware, however, that there is a limit, I believe it is 10 items that could be waiting in your mailbox before you actually start losing items. So keep a rough estimate of how many items maybe are being mailed to you and be sure to go claim those before you get overflow. Another thing to be aware of when you are selecting what items to equip. 
Some items have innate affixes, in particular weapons. So the choice between a bow versus a crossbow, well, every bow has a certain affix on it, and every crossbow has a certain affix on it, every dagger a certain affix, every sword a certain affix. So depending on what kind of build you're going for, you might prefer a certain base weapon type. Other item slots could also have certain inherent affixes that only roll on that slot, like Pants, for instance, will tend to have inherent affixes related to potions, but there's no distinction between class of two different pants. So there are a few different inherent affixes that can roll on those pants, and you just won't get those on other itemization slots. Another thing to be aware of when it comes to items is the plus to a certain skill affix. If you don't have that skill, you get that skill. You can use a skill just from having it as an affix of plus one rank to such and such skill. The second thing to be aware of is the plus to a skill allows you to go above the five skill point limit. So every skill you can invest five skill points into, every active skill, maximum of five skill points, but you can get well above that via plus to skill affixes and the power does increase. Now a general piece of advice about finding items. People ask, when do I sell? When do I salvage? At low level, gold is generally not an issue. Gold in this game is a valuable resource, don't get me wrong. Everything, the higher level you go, gets increasingly expensive, and everything you want to do costs you gold. But, the higher level you go, the more gold you get for selling items. What doesn't scale up, the higher level you go, is the materials you get for salvaging items. So we're gonna move into talking about the blacksmith here, where you can salvage items at the blacksmith, break them down into crafting components. In my experience, before level about 50, before end game, I never needed more gold, so I was always salvaging my items. After that, things are costing a lot. That's when I started selling. I would still break down legendaries, but I would sell other items. So rare and lower get sold, and then the legendaries and uniques that I'm not using, those get salvaged. That said, in general, if you run out of either resource, change things up. So if while you're going through the campaign you run out of gold, then start selling some stuff. But by default, I would say salvage throughout the campaign. Now, the other thing the blacksmith can do is upgrade gear. The first couple ranks of a gear upgrade are relatively cheap. If you have a decent piece of gear, it's a good idea to upgrade it. At least pop a couple upgrades on it. While leveling, this is especially important for your weapons. If you have an item that is really good, then you can consider upgrading it a bit more, but be judicious with that in the early game. Try to save your materials for the later game. Now here's something of an advanced tip for upgrades. There's a hidden mechanic within the item power of gear. There are breakpoints in item power where if you move into the next breakpoint, if the upgrade from your blacksmith is able to move you into that next item power breakpoint, you can get a substantial increase in power. Each tier of power carries within it a specific affix range. So any given affix can roll within a certain range, and at every subsequent tier, that range is better and better and better. So for argument's sake, at the lowest tier, you might be able to get plus one to a skill, and then at a higher tier, it can be plus two to four to a skill. It's just a random example. So if you get an item and you happen to notice, oh, I am very close to the next power level threshold, pop those couple upgrades and get yourself over there. Now the higher ranks of upgrades start to cost a lot, so only consider doing those for gear that is really good. Gear that you don't think you're gonna be replacing quickly, so generally, before endgame, you're never going to be fully maxing out your upgrades. So it's just not worth investing in an item that you're going to be replacing within 20 minutes. But let's say you're in World Tier 4 and you get a really good ancestral item for your build. Yeah, feel free to knock out all the upgrades there. Now another NPC in town that you're going to use for empowering yourself is the Occultist. And this is where we talk about aspects. So you're going to find a legendary item and that legendary item is going to have a legendary power on it, aka an aspect. You can go to the Occultist, and you can destroy, break down that legendary item, and extract that aspect. And you can then imprint that aspect onto a different item. You can imprint it onto either 
a rare item or a legendary item. If it's a rare item, it'll turn it into a legendary item. If it's a legendary item, it's gonna overwrite the existing legendary property. You don't get to stack two of them, sorry. However, once that has been imprinted, it cannot be extracted a second time. So imprinted aspects cannot be extracted. That means if you have a really good one with a really good roll on it, because it's gonna save whatever that roll was on the affix, you might wanna hold off to put it on a really good item. Also, you could take aspects from regular items and imprint them onto sacred or ancestral items. There was some confusion about that. Some people were reporting that you can't, but a lot of people are able to. One thing to be aware of, however, is that you cannot imprint any aspect onto any piece of gear. Different aspects can only go into certain gear slots. Aspects are grouped into five different categories. Defensive aspects, which can be imprinted onto shields, helms, chest, pants, and amulets. Offensive aspects, which can be imprinted onto amulets, weapons, gloves, and rings. Resource aspects can only be applied to rings. Utility aspects can be put on shields, helms, chest, amulet, gloves, and boots. And then mobility aspects can only be put on amulets and boots. Another thing to be aware of is if you imprint an aspect onto an amulet, it actually gains 50% bonus to whatever its number is. So it is 50% more effective on an amulet. And if you imprint an aspect onto a two-handed weapon, it is twice as effective. It is 100% more effective. So you want to use that to your advantage. Think about your build. Which are the aspects that you would benefit most from doubling or increasing that number by a factor of 1.5 and put those there, if applicable. Now, you can get aspects by extracting them from legendary powers, but you can also get aspects via the Codex of Wisdom. Every dungeon in the game, once you complete it for the first time, unlocks within your Codex of Wisdom across all your characters a aspect. So every dungeon gives you an aspect, but not all aspects can be found in dungeons because there are more aspects than there are dungeons. But again, once it's in your Codex, you have it forever. It is a blueprint that you can use infinitely. You don't have to farm it a second time. The downside is that it has the lowest possible roll of that aspect. So you're going to find aspects and those will in general be better rolls than the aspects that you get within the dungeons. Still, if you don't have the drop, this is a deterministic way to hunt for aspects that are good for your build. This is a very good thing to do early game and even positioning yourself towards the late game, maybe you have a really good roll on an aspect, but you're holding on to it because you don't want to waste it on a mid-tier item. So in the meantime, you put on the weaker codex aspect. And another tip, if you know what aspect you're hunting for and you know it's within the codex of power, click on that aspect within the codex of power and it's going to actually pin the location on your map to the dungeon that you need to go to to unlock it. And because the Codex of Wisdom is shared across all your characters, in general, if you have a main and then alts, you can use your main to quickly farm up relevant Codex powers for your alts. And again, as mentioned before, you can split farm Codex powers. As long as someone in your party, you can be in town doing nothing. If someone in your party completes a dungeon, you'll have it completed for yourself as well, and it'll count towards your Renown and your Codex. Now, while you're leveling 1 to 50, it's going to be expensive to use these imprints. You won't be able to do it constantly, so you probably want to find the one, maybe two powers that'll be most beneficial to your build and imprint those. But where do you imprint it? You might be tempted to imprint it onto your two-handed weapon. Well, while leveling, the itemization slots that you're going to be changing most frequently will be your weapon. The other slots really don't matter as much while you're leveling, nearly as much as your weapon does. You're leveling fast, and at every higher level, weapons drop that deal more damage. Your weapon dictates the damage of all your skills. So if you imprint onto your weapon, well, now what happens when you find a better weapon? Now you have to decide, do I want more damage on my base weapon or do I want to lose this legendary power because I can't afford to keep imprinting? So a good option instead then would be to put it on your amulet. You don't need to really change your amulet. In fact, throughout the campaign, you can keep the same amulet throughout the entire 1 to 50 journey, especially if it has a good legendary affix on it. So imprint onto the amulet, you get that 1.5 times bonus to it and you're good. Alternatively, if you're playing a melee rogue, then you're never using your bow. Your bow is a two-handed weapon 
your ranged weapon that is. It's a two-handed weapon, so you can get double the bonus, and it doesn't matter if your bow stays a level 10 bow that does no damage, because that damage is not factored into your melee attacks. If you're a barbarian, you can maybe get away with that as well. If you're gonna... In your arsenal system, you have two two-handed weapons, and you have your dual-wielding weapons. Depending on your exact skill setup, you might be able to have one of your two two-hander slots that is just dead, and you just put an aspect on it. Now, lastly with the Occultist, you can actually re-roll one affix on every item. It's expensive, though. I would not advise doing this until you are done with the campaign, and then really just save it for gear that you think you're going to keep for a very long time. Because again, it is expensive and you want to save that resource for your end game GG gear. Now another source of upgrades will be the Jeweler. The Jeweler is how you upgrade jewelry. Uh, your Blacksmith upgrades your other gear, so same rules apply to jewelry here for upgrades. As for gems, you also upgrade your gems at the Jeweler. People ask, when do I get the higher, or how do I get the higher gem recipes? They'll just appear. There's level breakpoints. Once you reach a certain level, that recipe will appear in the jeweler. There's nothing you have to do actively. You can remove gems from the jeweler, but it'll cost you gold. If you don't care to keep the base item, then just salvage that item at the blacksmith for free and get the jewel back. Get that gem back. The jeweler also lets you add sockets to gear, and this does not consume an affix slot. Not every piece of gear can have sockets, but a helm can have one socket, Chest can have two, pants can have two, jewelry can have one, one handed weapon can have one socket, two handed weapon can have two sockets. Another important NPC you don't want to skip is the alchemist. As you're going through the campaign, your potion is going to be able to level up whenever you hit certain levels. Don't forget to level up your potion. Do that as soon as you can. By leveling up your potion, it's going to restore more of your health. You also want to make sure you have the resources to level up the potion, so the alchemist uses herbs. So whenever you are passing by a flower or a plant, click on that, get those resources, you need them to level up your potion. The Alchemist is also a source of being able to craft potions that'll give you 5%, they're called elixirs, they give you 5% more XP for 30 minutes plus some other effect. You're also going to find elixirs as different rewards in different instances. You have a shared inventory for elixirs and Nightmare Sigils. You can put those in your regular stash, but carrying on you, there is a maximum, so don't think you can hoard these forever. Stash base is rather limited, so you can be pretty loose with your usage of those potions. Pop it, even if it's not applicable, do it just for that 5% more XP. At higher level, you're going to get into and have access to Incense, which is going to be a party-wide buff. Early on, those will be harder to make, so do save them for when they're significant. All right, let's talk a bit about Paragon Boards and Glyphs. So, every Paragon Board has a Glyph socket in it. Glyphs are things that you put into the sockets of Paragon Boards. Every class has a fixed number of Glyphs that they can find. You're gonna find Glyphs in different ways. Nightmare Dungeons is one source, but you can get them elsewhere. You'll never get duplicate Glyphs, so once you found every Glyph, they'll stop dropping. Glyphs need to be leveled up to be made stronger, and you will level up your Glyphs via Nightmare Dungeons. Every Paragon board beyond your starter board will have a legendary node on it with some kind of cool legendary effect. And while that is the sexiest part of the Paragon board, arguably the more powerful thing will be in the endgame the Glyph that you socket into it. And you can pop Glyphs out and put them back into the Paragon board. You can level them up while they are in your Paragon board. So definitely use some kind of interim Glyph on your way to finding your best Glyph. And of course, in case you're unaware, you can rotate the Paragon board. In order to unlock your subsequent Paragon boards, you need to make your way to a gate node, and then your next point will give you access to another Paragon board. You select between those boards, and then you can rotate the board around in whatever orientation you feel will be most beneficial to you. All right, winding down here, let's talk about XP farming. People ask, what's the fastest way to level up? Well, technically the fastest way to level up if you're a level one character is gonna be to have someone power level you, basically carry you through the capstone dungeons, and then they can run nightmare dungeons at high level. You just sit in the doorway, soak XP, and you'll level really quickly. That's power leveling. If you're not power leveling, then the most effective way to farm XP is going to be split farming. So you're in a party, you split up within a dungeon. You're going to find not nightmare dungeons, regular dungeons that have good density of monsters within them. And you're going to run that dungeon over and over and over, split up into four different directions. 
And be because it doesn't matter where you are in the dungeon, as long as you're in a dungeon with someone else, you're gonna get the XP. So you just split up and efficiently farm, reset the dungeon. You reset the dungeon by leaving game, breaking up the party, reforming the party to create a new instance, and you run it again. These tricks are in the process of being nerfed by Blizzard. So we can call out specific dungeons, but Blizzard again has been doling out nerfs to nerf specific strategies that are kind of doing this because it's not it's not the way the game should be played. But technically this is the fastest way to level up. Now if you're a solo player, the best XP farm will be Nightmare Dungeons. Basically once you unlock World Tier 4, your focus should become on running Nightmare Dungeons. It's good XP and it's going to be leveling up your glyphs, which again are going to be a huge source of your character power. And for maximum XP gain, you want to be slightly underleveled, maybe about three levels, relative to the monster level that you're fighting. So just a very simple and basic rule to remember is what level Nightmare Dungeon to run? Take your character level, subtract 50. So if you're level 75, run a Nightmare Dungeon roughly level 25. You can go up to like level 28. Now throughout Diablo 4's life, the most effective way and fastest way and most efficient way to level up is going to change. But here's one thing that's never going to change. And that's, what are the pros doing? Why is it that after four days, someone already reached level 100? How are these blasters, these streamers, these pro players, how are they hitting level 100 so fast? And the most simple answer is, they don't waste time. They do not let off the accelerator for a moment. All the time that we might be spending looking at our skill tree. Hmm, what does this skill do? Should I take this? Hmm, I found this piece of gear. Should I equip this? What are these affixes? All of this, if you cut away all of this time, which is what they do, they are spending pretty much zero time on all these decisions and are just blasting the game. If you're thinking and not doing, if you're analyzing and not doing, you are falling behind. That said, that's not how I play. That's not how I enjoy playing the game. I like to look at the gear. I like to see, ah, what item affix is rolled here. That's interesting. The most effective thing to do is tell yourself, the amount of time that I'm spending analyzing whether this is a 0.5% upgrade, I could have gotten more XP and been getting better item drops by that point, right? That's that's the optimal way to play, sure. But that's not how I enjoy playing. That's why I'm always going to be a casual scrub, because I like to enjoy the game. I like to savor the game. I like to stop and smell the roses. I like to know what the most effective things to do are, but I'm not going to do them if it hurts my enjoyment of the game. And my advice to you folks is, don't optimize the fun out of this new game that you've potentially been waiting years for, unless that is the most fun way for you to play. Because for some people, they love that blasting. And there's nothing wrong with either way of playing, but yeah, blasting is going to blast you ahead of everyone else. Now we'll finish up with some miscellaneous tips about quality of life and uh, even uh, control schemes. So, first off, junking items is a thing. If you hover your mouse over an item and press spacebar, it marks an item as junk. Then when you go to a vendor, if you right click to sell one of your junk items, it'll sell all your junk items. If you go to salvage items, you can salvage all of your junk items at the same time. Another thing, in case you don't know, you can right click to place a pin on the overworld map. So you bring up overworld map, you want to go to this place, just right click, it's going to lay down a pin, it's going to give you a navigable path to that place. That said, it might not always be the most efficient or most reliable path. I'd say 75% of the time it's accurate. But because of the 25%, I still find myself bringing up my map pretty often. Another option, in your game settings, enable advanced tooltip compare if you want to be able to see all the different affixes and ranges on your gear. Another tip, if you hate, I'm out of mana, I can't do that, I can't do that, I can't do that now. In your sound options, disable player audio on error. Another thing, a lot of Diablo 3 players like to bind their force move command to the scroll wheel and think you can't do it in D4. You can. You just first have to go and disable scroll on zoom. Then you're free to bind the scroll wheel to whatever you want, such as force move like I have. Another tip, the radial menu. When you hold E to bring up your radial menu for the emotes and scroll through that, anything there can be bound to keys. You don't have to bring up the radial menu. Also, you can put elixirs in that radial menu and you can then bind that to a key 
Also, in case you folks don't know, you can leave dungeon. You don't have to backtrack all your way through the dungeon. You don't have to town portal out at the end. There is a leave dungeon button. You can either just bring up the map and click the exit of the dungeon or bring up the radial menu and select leave dungeon. Or again, bind that to a key to have a one key press exit dungeon at the end of dungeon. Asterisk, you can't do this during main story dungeons for whatever reason. Now, before I leave you folks, I have the one most single ultimate important tip to become the absolute best Diablo 4 player you can possibly be. You're going to go to a town. You're going to find a dog. You're going to move right up to that dog and you're going to bring up your radial menu and you're going to click on hello and you're going to pet that damn dog. And that's going to wrap up this video, folks. As a reminder, do check out my mechanics video and the update. There are already updates. There's an update video to the mechanics video, plus updates in the description on all the most updated information regarding all these terms. Lucky hit, fortify, barrier, everything. What is it? It's all covered over there. Also, if you have other beginner tips, drop them in the comments below. Thanks for watching. Special thanks to my Twitch, Patreon, and YouTube supporters for making these videos possible. If you enjoyed this video, please share it. Check out these other videos and subscribe to join Rikers Raiders for more Diablo content.